All right, welcome everyone to the Fair Vote Canada webinar on mixed member proportional representation. Uh, my name is Anita Nickerson and I'm Fair Vote Canada's action coordinator, which basically means that I help um, coordinate national and provincial actions and I support volunteers. And with us today, we again have our special guest, which is Byron Weber Becker. Byron is a lecturer in computer science at University of Waterloo, and he's done extensive system modeling for, uh, for the Federal Electoral Reform uh, Committee. So after he presented there, they actually asked him to do some additional system modeling for them. So he's kind of mapped out uh, what each of the made for Canada or possibly made for BC models could look like. So this is the second of a three-part series on system mechanics. So the first one we did was multi-member systems and you'll find that on our YouTube channel and if you can't just email me and I'll tell you where to find it. This one is just on mixed member proportional and then in about two weeks we'll be doing one on a hybrid model that we developed called Rural Urban Proportional, which was actually one of the systems recommended by the NDP and Greens in their supplemental report, along with MMP. Okay, so before I start, I want to make sure that everybody can see and hear me and Byron. So if you could go to your question box and just tell me if you can see and hear me. Yes. Okay, that's good. All right. Thank you very, very, very much. Okay. Um, so while Byron's talking, you can be typing questions into that question box for him and he may stop uh, partway through the presentation to look at some of the questions that have come in so far about the material that he's presented so far or he may wait till the end and then deal with them all. At the end, we will deal with any um, you know, remaining questions, whether it's about MMP or about PR in particular. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn off my webcam and I'm going to turn it over to Byron. Okay, thank you, Anita. Um, so, like Anita said, my name is Byron Weber Becker, and uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about making every vote count with mixed member proportional systems today. Um, so, the I'm going to go back to the, question, to the question box and ask, can you see a slide with Fair Vote Canada logo on it that says make every vote count with mixed member uh, systems? Just to make sure that you can see what I want you to see. Oh, there's some no's there. Okay, so we need to figure out how to... All right, Byron, I think, okay. I, uh, I, think I did it. Okay, so I'm going to trust now that people can see the slide, make every vote count with mixed member systems, and here we go. So uh, some of you no doubt will have uh, tuned in to the system, to the webinar that we had several weeks ago about system, uh, about mil uh, multi-member systems and uh, you'll see some uh, brief stuff at the beginning where we uh, talk about some of the same things but then we'll quickly diverge into the multi-member systems after that. Um, so just to set the stage, um, we'll, uh, what we want to talk about today. First of all, we want to talk about what are appropriate electoral reform principles. This basically duplicates some of the material from uh, that previous webinar. We'll go over it quickly today, just to remind ourselves. We'll talk about which electoral systems are other countries using very briefly, just to see whether we're out in left field or not with these suggestions. Then the meat of it will be how do mixed member systems actually work. We'll talk about, we'll go back to those principles that we start with, ask whether these systems actually deliver on those principles, and then we'll finish up with some questions and where to find more information. So here's the uh, electoral reform principles that were given to the parliamentary committee that met a year ago. That's a huge wall of text, so let's break that down uh, more in point form. The first of the values that they were given was effectiveness and legitimacy. That essentially means that whatever system we recommend needs to fairly translate votes into representatives. 
And the feeling, of course, is that our current first-past-the-post system does not do that. It does not fairly translate votes into representatives, and we see that you know, every time we have a, a party with 40% of the vote, or even less than 40% of the vote, and they still get a significant majority of seats in, in the House. Uh, a second value that was uh, specified was engagement. They wanted uh, the systems, the voting process to encourage people to vote, to foster greater civility and collaboration in politics, uh, less of, of members from different parties cutting each other down and name calling and all the antics that we see in parliament. One of the system to enhance social co cohesion, to help us feel like a society that's pulling together in the same direction. And they wanted it to include underrepresented groups. The system should avoid undue voting complexity while respecting these other principles, like fairly translating votes into representatives. The system should, be in, should have integrity. It should safeguard the trust in the election process. People should believe that it actually does what it says it should do. And it should give reliable and verifiable results. We can go back after the election and say, yeah, that turned out the way it was supposed to. Local representation has been important to Canadians for a long time. We see that as a way to ensure accountable MPs that when they're doing a good job, we can return them to office, and when they're doing a poor job, we can turf them out and replace them with somebody else. Local representation, where you know each a given geographical riding has their own MP, gives us access to those MPs. They have offices in our neighborhoods where we can go and visit them and see them face to face. And when it's election time, they need to elect, they need to campaign in our neighborhood. It also uh, helps us believe that the MPs actually understand our local conditions and will act on behalf of local needs when they are in Ottawa. So those are the five basic values that uh, the government gave to the Electoral Reform Commission. And, you know, really, most reformers have no problems with these values as being really important ones for whatever uh, electoral system we advance. We do believe, though, that uh, there was one that was missed. And that is that we think that the electoral system has a profound effect on good governance. Good governance is, uh, uh, occurs when we have stable government that can advance their agenda and governments that enact long-lasting policies that are supported by the majority of the voters. Uh, first past the post has given us relatively stable governments, but it has not given us governments that enact long-lasting policies. We see this with, you know, the, the conservatives came in 15 years ago and immediately threw out lots of policies from the previous liberal government, and then the liberals came in again in 2015 and threw out lots of policies of the previous conservative government. And what we need are more of those long-lasting policies supported by the majority of voters, like our healthcare system and uh, CPP and, and so on. So those are the values that we'll want to uh, compare mixed member systems against after we learn more about what they are. First though, um, let's just acknowledge that there are a variety of different kinds of electoral systems that fall into several families. One family is the winner take all systems. Another family is proportional systems. Canada currently, of course, has a first past the post system, which is one of those winner take all systems. Another one that has often been proposed is alternative vote. Uh, in the proportional side, multi-member is one subfamily of electoral systems. Mixed member is another. We talked about multi-member systems in the previous webinar. We'll talk about mixed member systems today. And then in the third webinar that's coming up in about two weeks, we'll talk about rural urban proportional, which is a hybrid of multi-member and mixed member. So who is using different kinds of proportional representation systems? Um, when we ask this question, we really want to know which other countries that are more or less like Canada are using which systems. And so one way of measuring which countries are more or less like Canada is to look at the UN's Human Development Index. If we look there at democracies that score very high on that UN Human Development Index, we find Canada, lots of European states, and you know other relatively wealthy, well-educated uh, democracies that uh, that would feel comfortable with. 
when we look at that set, we find that uh, the winner-take-all systems are used by, well, first past the post by four countries, the United States, Canada, of course, Singapore, and the United Kingdom. Alternative vote is used by only one of those 50 or so countries, that is Australia. France, Bahrain, and Belarus use some other kinds of winner-take-all systems. Um, but out of those 50 countries, 50 or so countries on the UN's that are very high in the UN Human Development Index, really a pretty small handful of those use uh, electoral system from the winner-take-all family of systems. On the other hand, on the proportional representation side, lots of countries use uh, a proportional system. Multi-member systems are uh, the most prominent. Most of these, many of these would be list-based systems. Um, a few would be single transferable vote. Um, and then there's uh, three out of the 50 or so that use mixed member proportional, which is the system that we'll be talking about today. There's also several countries that use parallel systems, but uh, we won't be addressing those at all. Uh, no one is proposing those for Canada. So when it comes to what we currently have and those values that we talked about earlier, winner-take-all systems don't do a good job of fairly translating votes into, representative, into representatives. We've seen that over and over with first past the post. In terms of engagement, those winner-take-all systems don't particularly encourage voting. People have the sense that, uh, why should I vote? It doesn't really count anyway because I'm in a minority. Um, with first past the post, there's less civility and collaboration because such a small swing in, in a relatively small number of voters can make a huge difference in the number of seats that a party has in parliament. So there's an incentive built into our electoral system for wedge politics and to trash the other folks and to not work together. Um, and in such, an, in such a setting, it's easy to believe that our social co cohesion, the sense that I'm not being listened to, that I don't have a voice, that others are pulling the country in ways that I don't want to go, um, is, is undermined. And first past the post certainly does not do a good job of including underrepresented groups. In terms of accessibility and inclusiveness, well, that's where we talk about avoiding undue voting complexity, and that is undoubtedly one of the strengths of first past the post. It's as simple as voting system as you can have, pretty much. Uh, but there's a saying in some quarters that you want to have things simple as you can, but not too simple. As simple as possible but no simpler. And uh, there might be, many of us have the feeling that uh, first past the post has made things too simple and uh, uh, with unfortunate results. Integrity, uh, just about every voting process in, uh, that we've talked about has that integrity. That's a not, you know, it's, it's just there and we won't address that further. Uh, local representation. Um, in the previous webinar, you might recall that I, I had a check mark beside ensure accountable MPs for uh, winner-take-all systems. I got challenged on that after the fact and said, but in, in winner-take-all systems, like first past the post, there are so many absolute safe seats. The person said, in some writings, a fence post with hair could win if they had the right party label. And so um, I've replaced that check mark with a question mark here just to say, you know, maybe it's not the case that, that first past the post always gives us accountable MPs. Um, and they give accessible like-minded MPs to those people who voted for them, but the rest of us are left out in the cold. Um, first past the post is uh, generally credited with yielding stable governments. I won't quibble with that, but as I noted earlier, those they don't necessarily in uh, long-lasting policies that are supported by the majority of voters. So winner-take-all systems uh, stacks up fairly poorly on this list of values that were given to the, uh, to the reform committee by uh, earlier on when they started their work. So the question is now, how do the multi-member systems work? And then we'll circle back and ask again, how do they compare on that list of values? So multi-member systems, um, I'm sorry, I uh, 
Yes, I wanted to do a brief recap of multi-member systems from the last webinar, and then we'll move to mixed member systems, which is our major topic today. Multi-member systems combine several writings into one, but elect the same number of MPs. An example of Waterloo Region, where I live, we have, say, five ridings in our area, shown there on the left. If we combined those into the same area, but uh, removed those riding divisions and had just one riding, larger riding, as shown on the right, but still elected five MPs, how might things turn out? Well, in the 2015 election, those five ridings elected four liberals and one conservative. But the question is, if we change the system, how might it work? In the 2015 election, as I noted, uh, we elected four liberals in our five riding area. That's 80% of the MPs, in spite of the fact that only 46% of us voted liberal. That came, of course, at the expense of the Conservatives, the NDP, and the Green. We didn't get, uh, the NDP and the Green didn't get any seats in this area, in spite of their vote share. If we elected those five MPs across the region, that whole region of five ridings, we might do it so that it was two conservatives, two liberals, and one NDP. That's much closer to proportional, as those bar graphs show. It's not perfect, but it's much closer. And then, last in the last webinar, we talked about a variety of mechanisms for that to happen. So in mixed member systems, we want to reach that same goal of proportionality, but the mechanism that we use is different. In mixed member systems, what we do is we combine single member ridings into a multi-member region. And again, we'll have an example from Southern Ontario. So what does it mean to have single member ridings in a multi-member region? Here's our example. Um, it's a larger example than before. Uh, covers about 15 ridings here in central Ontario. Uh, uh, basically from where Anita and I live in the in the south part of that colored diagram up into Georgian Bay and, and so on. Um, zooming in on that, if we look back to the 2015 election, this larger region of 15 ridings elected five liberals, concentrated down there in, in the uh, larger uh, area around Kitchener, Waterloo, and, and Cambridge, and then conservatives, 10 conservatives in the less densely populated areas to our north. When we look at uh, the votes versus the MPs, it's highly disproportional, but different than how it was uh, in that smaller area that we looked at for multi-member. Uh, here we see 42% of this larger region voted liberal, 41% voted conservative. And so you'd expect us to have about the same number of liberal MPs as conservative MPs. But first past the post distorted that and gave us gave the liberals about one third of the seats and the conservatives two thirds of the seats rather than 50-50. And again, the NDP and the Greens were shut out. So how does mixed member proportional address that? What it does is take single member ridings in a multi-member region, as I said before. In this example, we have 15 MPs in that larger multi-member region. 10 of those, for example, would be in single member ridings, leaving five that could represent the region at large. Those regional MPs are chosen to ensure proportionality. So we still have 15 MPs, just like now, but 10 of those are in single member ridings, and those single member ridings would be larger than they are now. That leaves five left over to represent the region at large, and we elect those in such a way that they are uh, ensure proportionality of the vote. So let's explore that further. Here's my attempt at redistricting that region from 15 ridings shown in the small map on the left to 10 ridings shown in the larger map on the right. Uh, the ridings got bigger. Um, in fact, about every three ridings got combined into two. We can guess at how uh, those, we could guess at how the voters would have elected uh, in 2015, would guess probably four liberal MPs elected in the in the center down at uh, in the in the center at the bottom, and probably six conservative MPs in the rest of the 
of the region. But that still leaves five MPs left over to represent the region as a whole. The question is, how do we elect those to ensure proportionality? If we elected them proportionally, would have about six liberal MPs, about six conservative MPs, or 40% of the total for each of those, and that's appropriate. They each got about 40% of the vote. The NDP, who got 12% of the vote, would get two MPs. That gives them a slightly higher than their share of, of MPs, but still much, much more proportional than we had before. And even the Greens might get one MP out of this based on their 5% of the vote. So that's the goal. The question is, how does a multi-member get there? Sorry, mixed member get there. How do we elect those five regional MPs to make things proportional? Well, we'd want, in this case, two of them to be liberal. Remember that we, to be proportional, we need six for liberal MPs. Four got elected in the individual ridings, so we need to top them up with two additional uh, liberal seats. The conservatives already have six seats in those individual single seat ridings, so they don't get any of, of these five extras. The NDP get two, and the Greens get one. So to recap, we can look at this from uh, top down. In the top down description, we divide the country or province into regions. Each of those regions will have eight to 20 seats. We take that region and set aside half to two thirds of the seats for local single seat ridings. Those are ridings like we have now that each have their own uh, individual member. And then the remaining seats, the other one third to one half of the seats represent the region at large and they're chosen to make the number of seats held by each party proportional to the vote. Another way of looking at this is from the bottom up. If we start with our existing ridings, would make them somewhat bigger and as a result there would be fewer seats. But then we take and we group those ridings into regions. Okay. Of, but then we take those extra seats in each region that result as a make of, as a result of, of making those writings larger, and those extra seats represent the region as a whole and are filled to make the overall result proportional. So these two things, the top-down description, the bottom-up description, they're describing the same thing, but just starting at different places. One is starting with the big thing, the country or the province, and going down, and the other is starting with the writings that we know now and saying how does it, how, what are the layers on top of that. But they're attempting to describe the same thing. But that still leaves us with a question of how do we elect those regional uh, MPs or fill those regional seats? Well, I'm going to talk about three different ways to do it. First one is closed list. In a closed list approach, everyone has two votes. The first one is for the local riding, and that would be like we do now, no different than we do now. You'd have one MP, sorry, one candidate from each of the uh, parties, plus perhaps an independent or several independents. They would be on a on a ballot and you would put an X beside the one that you most want to be your local MP. But then you have another second vote. That vote is used to establish the party proportionality. The first one determines who is going to be your local MP. The second one is what proportion should a party have in parliament? Uh, what share of power should they have in parliament? And so here we indicate your party of choice. This person liked the Green candidate best for their local MP, but wanted the Liberals to actually uh, be, be their representatives uh, overall. So then, uh, how do we, uh, uh, sorry, so then the riding seat is obviously is filled with, uh, with that first ballot, and the regional seats are filled based on that second ballot. So how that second ballot works, 
in a closed list system, and remember we're going to describe three different ways of doing this, in a closed list system, before the election, parties make an ordered list of their candidates. So the Conservatives will have an ordered list, the Liberals will have an ordered list, the NDP and the Greens will each have their ordered list. That's typically of all the candidates that they have running in that region. I've, I've italicized the word ordered there because it's important that there is an ordering here and uh, meaning a first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice, and this will become apparent in just a moment. That ordered list might be prepared by the party brass. That probably won't go over well in Canada. Another approach would be that it's ordered by votes in the nomination contests, or I'm sure there's lots of other ways of doing it as well. After the voting in the election has happened, you remove the candidates that won a local seat. So for example, here, the Conservatives, let's say that uh, their candidate Cohn, Cooper, Chong, Cathers, Clark, and Sismarov all won seats. Those are the six candidates that won the seats in the local ridings. So they're taken off of the list. Likewise, the Liberals elected four people. So there's four people missing from their list as well. So take off the people who won a local seat. They've got their seat. And then take as many candidates as you need from the top of each party's list to make the results proportional. So the Conservatives deserved six seats. They got six seats. So nobody gets a list seat, so to speak, for the Conservatives. The Liberals deserved, in this scenario that we're working with, deserved six seats. They got four in those local ridings. And so they get two more seats from the, from the list. And the importance now is, is, should be apparent of why this list is ordered. That that determines that you take the top two off of that list. So somehow the Liberal Party said that it's more important for Long to be an MP than it is for Laverty to be an MP. And it's more important for Laverty to be an MP than Lawson to be an MP and so on and so forth. Well, fortunately, Long and Laverty got their seats in the local elections, so we don't have to worry about them anymore. Lawson and Lapp are the next in line to get seats. Um, and for the NDP, Neighbors and Noble are at the top of their list, so they get those regional seats uh, as well. And I haven't shown a list for the Greens, but in this scenario that uh, we're showing, they would deserve one seat as well to be taken from the top of their list. So that's one approach to fill in those five seats. The parties, before the election, make a list of, uh, of their candidates and those uh, regional seats are filled from that list in order starting at the top, skipping over anybody who got a local seat. Um, Whenever this has been, well, oftentimes when this has been advanced in Canada, there's uh, uh, people saying, but we don't want party brass to make those decisions. And that's a very legitimate critique. It would be important if this were uh, to happen in Canada that this process be transparent. Uh, and that's why I've suggested it possibly. And one way to do that would be to order the votes, uh, order them by the number of votes accumulated in the nomination contest, or you might have a US style primary election among the conservatives and among each party to decide how those candidates get ordered. But it would be important that that process is open and transparent. Um, a second way of filling those seats is called open list. Closed list is where the party has uh, an important role in establishing the order of the list. Open list is where the voters have that responsibility. So once again, everybody has two votes. And just like before, your local riding vote would be, ballot would be uh, a very simple affair listing the local candidates. You place an X by your favorite one. But then for those regional seats, um, you'd have this time a much larger ballot and would probably in fact list all of the candidates that are running in that region. Um, and so here we see, you know, all for the for the conservatives. We see two, four, uh, you know, not, uh, eleven candidates that are running, uh, and the same for the Greens, the Liberals, the New Democrats, and so on. You vote for one of those, okay, and that says where that you want that person at the top of the list, um, and. 
uh, the votes for, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So the riding seats are obviously local candidates with the most votes, but the regional seats, um, you'd count the total of votes for each party. So in other words, if we look at the conservatives, the number of votes for Cohn, the number of votes for Cooper, the number of votes for Chong, and so on, are all added together to get the total number of votes for the conservatives. That helps establish what their percentage of the vote is and what their share of parliament should be. You then calculate the number of regional seats for each party to be proportional. That's that process where you say, well, the conservatives in this region got 15, uh, sorry, 40% of the vote, and so they should have about 40% of the seats or six. Similarly, the liberals got about 40% of the vote, so that means they should have 40% of the seats or about six. Um, so that's what I mean by calculate the number of regional seats for each party to be proportional. Um, and then you fill that party's regional seats with candidates that have the most votes but didn't win locally. So once again, you have a list that is ordered by this time, not by what the party brass said, but by how many votes did that candidate get. And you fill it, you fill those regional seats with the top people on that list that don't already have a local seat. So that's the second way of filling those regional seats. The third way is a list free way. Everyone has one vote, namely in the local writing. So this would be very familiar with how it works now. Um, and of course, as with all of the other approaches, the local candidate with the most votes uh, gets that local writing uh, seat. And for the regional seats, you'd count the total votes for each party across that whole region. You'd calculate the number of regional seats for each party so that they'd get their fair share proportionally. And then those regional seats would be filled with party candidates who received the most votes but didn't win locally. Um, and so you, you, know, the, you might have, uh, you know, in, in, let's say, in Kitchener Center, you have the local liberal that actually won, okay? But there was, let's suppose, a close race. And so the conservative got, didn't win, but got many votes, more votes than, say, the conservative in the next uh, riding over. And so the one here would get the regional seat. Um, so this keeps it as simple as possible. Uh, from the voter's standpoint, but doesn't allow them to express as many preferences either. There are a number of, so, so that's um, sort of the, the, the big idea and three different ways of, three different variations of implementing this mixed member system. It's called mixed member system, by the way, because it's, it's mixing, you know, local representation of local ridings with region-wide representation from those from those regional MPs. There are a number of design decisions in when you're designing a mixed member uh, system that I just want to talk about briefly. First one is region size. In this example, we showed uh, 15 ridings in that region, 15 seats in that region. Uh, but the system could work with smaller, it could work with more. Um, if you have a larger system, let's say 20 or 25 seats in the region, um, or versus a smaller region where you have, say, only eight seats in the region, what are the trade-offs? Well, as you might expect, proportionality changes. The larger the region, the more seats there are in that region, the more proportional the system. And consequently, the smaller the region, the less proportional it is. Um, likewise, if you have a larger region with more MPs on it, the regional ballot is going to be much bigger. There's going to be more names on it. And a smaller region will yield, of course, a smaller ballot that's easier for people to manage. So more choice, more proportionality versus less proportionality, less choice, but a more manageable ballot. How do you trade that off is something that would need to be discussed. Um, in a larger region, it's more proportional, but those regional MPs, their responsibility is, is much more diffuse. They have a much larger area over which they are accountable, responsible, you know, whereas for a smaller region, they're much more local. 
Um, larger region, you ask, well, where was MP so-and-so? Well, you know, he has a bigger regions to cover, and so he doesn't show up here as much, and, and another trade-off to, to think about. Most proposals uh, for Canada have regions with 12 to 15 seats in them. Uh, maybe a little bit smaller in, in less dense populated areas up in the north or something, uh, perhaps larger in densely populated areas like Vancouver or Toronto. Another uh, design decision is the ratio of regional seats. You can have more regional seats or more local seats. In the scenario that I went over earlier, we had a total of 15 seats. Ten of those were regional, sorry, were local seats, and five of them were were, were uh, regional seats. But it could have been a different proportion. It could have been uh, instead of 10 local seats, it could have been only eight local seats and and seven that are regional. So what's the balance between regional seats and and local seats? Well. As you might expect, if you have more regional seats, the ones that are delib deliberately chosen to balance out the proportionality, you get more proportionality. More regional seats, more proportionality. Um, but if you have more regional seats, then your local riding size needs to get bigger. And I've got in fine print there, assuming that you still have the same total number of seats. Um, uh, that's just the way it works. You have more uh, more regional seats, you're going to have fewer uh, local seats, and so your local ridings need to get bigger. Um, that that uh, ratio varies right be between roughly 30% and 50% regional seats. Um, the example that I gave before is on the low end, about one third were regional seats. Um, uh, about 40%, so a little bit higher proportion than what I showed in the example, seems to be a sweet spot in what people propose. Um, if you have about a third of the ride, of, sorry, a third of the seats be regional, then the ridings are on average one and a half times larger. Uh, whereas if you have 50% regional seats, then the ridings on average are two times larger. In you know a relatively concentrated urban area like I live in, in Kitchener-Waterloo, having the riding be twice as large isn't a particularly big issue. But if you're looking at the north, uh, you know, or, or some areas in the west where ridings are already huge, doubling them can be an issue. And so uh, this, this is something to think seriously about. Another design issue is the rounding formula. Uh, the issue here is suppose that you can calculate how many seats each party should have and you come up with conservatives deserve 5.54 seats, liberals deserve 5.40 seats, NDP deserves 2.56 seats, and so on. So if you add up the 5, the 5, the 2, and the 1, that adds up to 13. And the question is who gets the other two seats? Um, and there are predictably several ways of deciding how to do that. One way is the highest remainder. You look at, and that's the simplest to explain, you look at the, at the decimal point there, you know, and greens deserve six-tenths of the 0 .60 seats, uh, which is larger than the NDP at 0.56, which is larger than the Conservatives at 0.54, so you just order them that way and take, in this case, the greens and the NDP is uh, deserving those those last two seats. Uh, highest remainder uh, generally favors smaller parties. Some of the other methods sometimes slightly favor the larger parties, um, but you know it's it's a relatively small difference in my observation. Um, so I'm not sure that this is something that we need to get stuck on. I think the the uh, yeah. I'd be I'd be happy with whatever rounding formula, uh, just so long as we get proportional representation. Um, another design decision is a threshold. Uh, this is a question of should a party be required to earn a certain percentage of the total vote before they receive a top-up seat or a regional seat, and the the question here is that it it prevents parties from fragmenting and getting a whole host of small parties is, is the goal here. Um, in a regional system like we've described today, uh, there's a fairly natural 
a fairly high natural threshold. So in the in the systems that have been proposed for Canada, I don't see this as a big issue, but certainly if somebody says, oh, but we need to protect against all sorts of fringe parties, uh, we can simply say, well, let's have a, a threshold to say you need 5% of the total vote in order to get any of those uh, regional seats. Um, Another design decision is ballots. Um, in the ballots that I showed in the example, I used uh, just a single check mark or X on the local ballots as well as on the, the regional ballots. But you could have those be preferential ballots. The voters could rank the candidates and say, here's my first choice, my second choice, my third choice, and use that to decide who the MP is. In local writings, that essentially becomes alternative vote. That leads to somewhat less proportionality, but that idea that everyone who is elected has a majority, it's sort of a manufactured majority, but, but that idea that, that everybody who is elected has uh, some level of backing from, from at least 50% of the population is appealing to very many people. So we might want to consider that for the local elections. In regions, if you have a, uh, a ranked ballot that could look like single transferable vote or some of the other uh, uh, multi-member systems that we looked at uh, in the last webinar. And that might give, you know, for example, if there's a candidate that has everyone's second choice vote, uh, it might allow them to sneak in and become the elected person uh, over two polarizing figures that each have more first choice ballots. Um, so that's another uh, decision to, to think about is whether there should be some degree of ranking within the, within the system. So uh, just to recap then, the basic idea is you take a region and the, say you know, 12, 15 ridings in that region, you make those ridings somewhat bigger to free up new, to free up some of the MPs, some of the seats to be used to represent the region as a whole and those seats are filled in such a way that the overall result is proportional. That's the core idea of mixed member proportional. Um, so when we compare the two, mixed member systems and multi-member systems, um, mixed member is proportional. Okay? It keeps the benefits of the local members of having a local MP for that local writing and the familiarity, frankly, of first past the post. But it also has regional members to ensure that everyone is represented and has somebody that they feel they can go to. Uh, in my region, it would have been that uh, those folks who voted Green or NDP would have, at the regional level, a Green or NDP member that they could go and talk to. Um, it does maintain the centrality of the party. Uh, the, the, it's the party vote that is used to determine the proportionality and uh, there's the, the party is worked into the system at a number of levels. If we compare that with multi-member systems like we looked at in the last webinar, it too is proportional. Okay. Uh, but rather than being party-centered, it's much more candidate-centered, that uh, the individual candidates are much more important than the party that you vote for. Um, everyone has multiple members and you choose the best for uh, uh, the best candidate or the best representative, the best member to go to for a particular situation uh, uh, when you want to talk to an MP. Um, and there's, I think, more in incentives for civility and collaboration because you have that uh, vying for the second and the third place votes. You don't want to trash your opponents because you might need their second and third place votes in order to win. And I think that carries over to the uh, to inform the behavior of those candidates once they are elected. Okay. So if we go back to those uh, values that we had at the very beginning, uh, uh, and compare these proportional multi-member, uh, sorry, mixed member systems. On the effectiveness and legitimacy, does it fairly translate votes into representatives? Well, yes, that's part of the design of the system to make sure that if the liberals have 40% of the vote, they get 40% of the seats. Um, that's a major part of the goal. 
But a byproduct of that is that it encourages voting. People can look at it and say, you know, I may live in a riding where some other party is going to win in my local riding, but it still matters to go out and vote because I can affect who is going to be uh, the regional MP and, and my voice will be heard. Okay? And that hearing of everybody's voice, I think, contributes a lot to the social cohesion, cohesion, to the feeling that we are all pulling in the same direction and trying to make a better society or for, for ourselves. Those regional MPs also in other countries have led to more underrepresented groups being represented in their house. Um, the voting is somewhat more complex. And so the question mark there probably ought to be an X. It is, um, well, it's more complex. Is it undue complexity? That's maybe where the question mark comes from. Uh, people in lots of other countries have figured out more complex voting systems than we have. I'm confident that Canada does too, but it is more complex than first past the post. On the other hand, first past the post does not respect those other principles and mixed member proportional does. Next member proportional safeguards the trust in the election process. Um, it gives results that you can verify at the end if you need to go back and do a recount, that's no problem. Um, you do have local MPs. Uh, everybody is accountable because everybody faces the, the, uh, uh, the voters. Um, the, there, some people do object in the closed list systems where the party brass order the seats, say, you know, there's too many safe seats. Uh, that is the reason for the question mark there, that there are some varieties of mixed member proportional that aren't quite as accountable as would like, but uh, we can design a system that is entirely accountable. Um, everyone has access to accessible, like-minded MPs because of those regional MPs um, I shouldn't say everyone, but nearly everyone, many more people would have access to somebody uh, of at least the same party that they voted for. And uh, because it is regional and with local MPs, the MPs should understand the local conditions and advance local needs. In terms of good governments, um, we see stability uh, when we look at long-term studies of of governments that are proportional, uh, including mixed member systems, we see uh, governments that are basically as stable as Canada has been. Uh, not, a, not an issue. But those governments, because they're proportional, because they're much more likely to need to reach out across party lines, are going to enact much longer lasting parties policies that are supported by the majority of voters. So uh, overall, we see that proportional systems in general and mixed member systems uh, are much more supportive of these values that we think are important uh, when we choose our electoral system. So in summary, uh, just briefly say proportional electoral systems satisfy our criteria much better than majoritarian systems like first past the post. The exception on that is simplicity. But voters, as I've said, in many other countries have figured it out, and I'm sure that Canada can too. And I'll also point out that voting is not that much more complex, but counting the vote is a responsibility of Elections Canada. Trust them to do it correctly. There are lots of different kinds of PR. We talked about sort of one kind today. There are real differences between mixed member systems like we talked about today and multi-member systems like in the last webinar, but really, any form of proportional representation meets that criteria much better than what we've got now. So with that, um, I'll stop talking and let Anita uh, start fielding questions and uh, we can try and get them answered. All right. Okay. Thanks everybody uh, for hanging in there. I know it was a little bit of a long presentation, but you know, if you need to go back on YouTube and review it, pretty much everything you need to know about MMP uh, is there. So that's great. So there are a few questions. Somebody's asking, um, why are there no parallel systems proposed for Canada? I, I, I want to take a stab at just explaining to anybody who doesn't know what a parallel system is. So if you remember with your mixed member example, that second vote, the party vote, determines how many seats a party should have. So if 40% of you vote 
NDP uh, on your regional list or one of their candidates, then the NDP should get 40% of the overall votes in your re overall seats in your region. Parallel doesn't work like that. Parallel sort of treats it like there's two separate elections. Uh, there's a bunch of seats that are all winner take all seats, and then there's a bunch of seats that'll be filled proportionally, and they're not related to each other. So it's kind of like um, the goal isn't to make the overall results proportional. The goal is to kind of add a token amount of proportionality on top of first past the post. So that's, that's a parallel system. And no, nobody has seriously proposed it for Canada. Although for those of you who are in BC, heads up. Um, the BC NDP just put out a survey, a consultation survey to the government uh, for people to fill out like the, our federal ERE did. And one of the systems they've listed there is mixed member majoritarian. That is a parallel system. I don't know why it's on there. I don't know what the idea is that they're floating that on a list. But if you're taking that survey, um, just be aware that if it ends in majoritarian, it's not a proportional system, Byron. I think you recapped that very well. Yeah. Um, uh, parallel systems add as much complexity to the whole thing as does a, a proportional system, but it doesn't give us the proportionality. So I don't really see a reason to consider it. Right. Okay. Um, and I mean, the parallel idea, to give you an example, in New Zealand, when they had their second referendum, which was insisted on by the, their large party in the right, that they have a confirmation referendum, which was really just, uh, it sounds good, right? Let's confirm people like it, but it was really the one big party that wanted it so they could have another, you know, crack at the bat to see if they could get rid of MMP. And what they were floating was a sort of a token proportionality instead of full MMP. So this is the same kind of, same kind of idea. It's just, it's not as good and, it, it, yeah, it's not as good. Um, other question here. Okay. Somebody wanted to know, so in a closed list, the party can stack the deck with their hacks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> There's the simple answer and the not simple answer. Yep. Yes, they simple can, answer. but no, they probably won't. So. I'll kind of explain to you what I mean. So right now we have, you know, you know, think about how parties nominate their local candidates now, right? You have to belong to the party in the local riding and you, there's a contest and you go vote. Now we all know where that goes off the rails, right? And when the party parachutes in their star and all that kind of stuff that we don't like. But in most races, it's a democratic vote of local riding members. So because Canadians have no... Uh, taste for this kind of undemocratic, I'll reward you by putting you at the top of my list kind of thing. New Zealand has a closed list MMP system. You may not realize that New Zealand is a closed list. Um, and uh, from my friend in New Zealand who's been on these webinars, he says that most of the nominations for the list are done democratically by the parties, you know, in a, you know, a transparent fashion. But there are some parties that aren't very good at that. And they haven't really caught on that, that uh, they need to be democratic and so that, that you do get party hacks on the list. So again, as you see now, there's differences in nomination contests between NDP, liberals, conservatives. With MMP and a closed list, we would see that here as well. There would be differences in the party in terms of how they filled uh, those list spots. Byron? Um. Yeah, no, you covered that well. I needed nothing to add. Okay, I'm letting you take the next one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I also want to say, too, about closed list, this is a big issue. Um, basically, nobody's proposing a closed list system in Canada. It's uh, acutely unpopular. It's people react to it just like you've said oh my god, my regional MP is going to be appointed by the party and rewarded. I can't get rid of them. They're loyal to the party, not to me. Um, and people want to have choice. That's our, that's our tradition in Canada, to be able to directly elect individuals. And also, if you look at the trends all over the world, there's been a lot of research on this. 
the trend over the world is moving away from closed list to more candidate-centered systems where voters have more choice. So I, I look at closed list as basically a straw man, and it's one that opponents like to bring up, but it's, I don't think it's an option that most voters are interested in. Um, okay, zipping down here. Okay, so somebody wants to know if we have a graph of how election, the last election would look overall with PR. Uh, we can send people that. We put out stuff like that on social media all the time. This one webinar is just on the mechanics of one system. To increase First Nation representation, which system would you recommend? Hmm. So, good question. Um, I think that I think that to increase First Nations representation, I would probably go towards a uh, multi-member system, which is much more candidate-centric than party-centric. In a party-centric system like mixed member, we've just look, been looking at, um, you know, that party vote is so incredibly important. Uh, and getting high on that list and whether that list is is determined by voters overall or whether that list is determined by party hacks really doesn't matter to get a regional seat you got to be high on a list and that's hard for for first nations to do you know or for any marginalized people to do whereas with the with the multi-member systems like we talked about in the previous webinar um, if you have a region with, say, uh, uh, nine candidates in it, nine seats to fill, then if you can get 10% of the people to vote for a candidate, one of that candidate will get in. You know, so it's, it's much more, I think it's easier for a marginalized group like First Nations to, to get actual representation under that, uh, that multi-member system than MMP. Anita, does that sound reasonable to you? I have a different point of view on that. All right, go for it. So I think, um, I don't think you're wrong, Byron. I just, I think this is one of the things where there's not enough research on countries that use the systems that are proposed for Canada to really make heads or tails of what would be better for Indigenous peoples specifically. Mm -hmm. So when you look at most of the world uses PR, they do. Most of the world uses list PR, uh, often closed list PR, you know, the whole country might be an electoral district with a list. Um, I, I did some, I did a look about a year or two ago really digging into this and trying to find out how many Indigenous people were elected in PR systems and it was impossible to um, sort it out because every country keeps track of their statistics differently, who they consider mm -hmm. Indigenous, what groups they keep track of. It was crazy. So in the STV and MMP systems, and of course blended versions of that, are rare systems. It's not that they're not, they're, they're not workable, but they're not the most common systems. So there's not a big pool of research to look at um, on that. So when we look at New Zealand, they've had incredible success seeing their uh, their indigenous people represented with MNP, but uh, their indigenous people also have seats set aside in parliament for them, which is totally separate from the electoral system right. that they've had for a hundred years. Um, and they had, like I said, they have a closed list MMP system with a very long closed list. And you know, between that, between them having their own party and between them having set aside seats, they have excellent representation. Mm -hmm. Would that happen here with our models? I doubt it. I, I don't think, I think either of the models is um, going to increase the diversity in our legislature at 100%. I think we're gonna see a big difference in terms of the number of women elected. We'll probably see a difference in terms of minorities elected, but can you drill down and say what would help Indigenous people specifically? I don't think so. I think it's important to bring Indigenous peoples into the conversation and, you know, instead of us sitting here trying to design something to help them, that's not what we want to be doing. We want to be bringing them in and saying, you know, what would help you uh, participate in our system and feel more represented? 
Byron? I'm going to stand by my original comments that I think multi-member systems will make it easier for Indigenous people to elect their own representative. But uh, I agree that there would be little research on that, and there's, uh, uh, you know, it's it's more based on thinking about how the systems work than than looking at uh, what's happened elsewhere. Yeah, quite, I mean, quite simply, with an MMP system, if the parties put diverse candidates on their list, it makes them look good. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's an incentive for them. They cannot run a list of all white men. They look bad because everybody can see the list and they look bad. So there's a natural incentive that kicks in when you have a list to put diversity on there. On the other hand, like Byron but, said, but Anita, let yeah. me let me just point out that you talked about a close. When you say that, you're talking about a list that is prepared ahead of time before the yeah. election, a closed list, mm -hmm. which you said nobody in Canada is proposing. Yeah, but you know what, Byron? Even with an open list, the parties are going to add candidates to improve diversity. Sure, they will. Yep. <laughs> so there you go. How much do you trust the parties to do it? So this comes back to the distinction that Byron's making, where multi-member system, like a single transferable vote, puts that power right in the hands of the, vo of the voters. So if you have a five-seat STV riding, if, like, say, 16% of people in that five-seat riding want to vote for the Indigenous candidate, they will be able to elect the Indigenous candidate. And that power is right with the people that live in those communities, not with the party. Yep. And I think that's what Byron's getting at. So I wouldn't, got it. I wouldn't disagree with him. Puts more All power right. in the hands of voters. Um, but I, I know that other people will disagree with, with us. Okay. Um, is there any indication of the preferred system the NDP and Greens and BC will recommend? Well, Anita's the... Uh, expert on that. She, it's part of her job to follow the BC politics. So what's going on, Anita? Uh, well, I mean, it would be kind of hard to miss that the NDP doesn't like single transferable vote. I mean, you know, if you follow this at all, I mean, they, they were against it in 2005. They were supposedly neutral, but basically against it in 2009. And since then, John Horgan said it's way too complicated. Andrew Weaver said his grandmother can't understand it. Um, so I don't think single transferable vote is their preferred system of choice. And on the other hand, I would note that on their consultation, single transferable vote is listed as an option. It was a option picked by the BC Citizens Assembly and it got a higher vote share in 2005 than any single system in any referendum on electoral reform in Canada. So um, I don't think it's it's not their preferred system. Party policy in the NDP has always been for mixed member proportional. And I, I would say that I the Greens I don't think have a specific policy, the BC Greens. I think they're open minded, but I do informally think that they some of them may prefer MMP, um, possibly because they think it's more proportional when it actually depends on how the system is designed. I hope that answers the question. Um, just wondering, is there a correlation between the choice of system versus the date of adoption of the voting system by a country? It feels to me like first past the post is an old default that is no longer in vogue. <laughs> Um, certainly, certainly, the newer democracies and uh, people who changed their system are moving away towards from first past the post majoritarian systems to systems that are uh, much more proportional. Um, if there is a change in uh, sort of which proportional system they're choosing uh, over time, I'm not sure. I, I, I couldn't speak to that. I'm not, I'm not aware of research about that. Anita? Yeah. Um, nobody picks first past the post in 2017. Nobody. I mean, I mean, I'd really challenge anybody, and I'd be curious if somebody can find me a case of a new democracy where that chooses first past the post. It just it doesn't happen. You know, it's the countries that inherited it from Britain 
that got stuck with first past the post. <laughs> Once you get stuck with first past the post, it's hard. If the parties don't want to get rid of it, it, it can be very difficult. But if you look at the trend around the world, so you remember I said that within the proportional family, there's a trend toward more candidate-centered systems where voters have more choice. There's a trend around the world toward moving toward proportional representation systems. And I can send you some data from IDEA that basically shows that everybody's moving in one way toward PR and nobody's moving in the other way. Like there was like one exception, I think it was like Sierra Leone or something. <laughs> so no, nobody's adopting first past the post. And some of the academic research too, um, particularly in new democracies and divided societies. So what I mean by that is societies with lots of different religious and ethnic groups, the recommendation is always for them to have a proportional system. And the reason for that is when different groups are included in the system, when they're included in the formal system and they have seats and representation and a voice, it's much better than when you exclude those groups from the system and force them to be on the outside because that leads to uh, unhappiness, let's say. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're not going to have a civil war here in Canada, obviously, you know, but there has been research showing there are fewer civil wars in countries with PR systems. And that's because the whole idea is to include people and like Byron said, give them a real voice, right? Not let the dominant group win every single riding. Um, okay, I was wondering, okay, I like that you compared PR to our current first past the post system. I was wondering if you could compare PR to uh, direct democracy. Byron. Uh, sure. Um, so, direct democracy um, is is a notion that you know everybody has a direct say on every question, uh, very much like the uh, you know Athenians did in ancient Greece. You get all the all the people together that that have a say, and you have a debate right there in the town square, and then vote. Um, but even then, of course, it, it wasn't uh, universal. It was really, you know, the wealthy white men that got to go down to the town square and have a vote and, and, and so on. Um, so how does it compare? You know, I haven't looked at that question very directly. Uh, obviously, direct democracy is going to be as proportional as you can get, but that's provided you can get the people engaged in it. You know, um, when we have trouble getting people to get out to vote you know, once every four or five years, I'm having trouble envisioning how direct democracy would actually work in a uh, busy society like Canada is right now. You know, direct democracy worked in ancient Greece because we had, well, because it was restricted to a group of people that had lots of leisure time. Uh, they were supported by slaves, they were supported by women, and so they could go down to the uh, to the town square and spend significant amounts of time there. That's not the reality that we have. Um, so I think the comparison would be an interesting academic exercise, but I don't know that it's really worthwhile. Anita? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't something I've done a lot of research on because we're trying to get Canada um, past the horse and buggy stage, okay? <laughs> so while most countries moved on 100 years ago to proportional representation and are now trying to further engage their citizens with things like, you know, direct democracy and, you know, citizens groups to, to have a collaborative budget and stuff, we're trying to get the, the horse out of the ditch here in Canada. So we're not going to be going from the system where the parties have all the power uh, with first past the post into a direct democracy model. We're trying to get to step step two here. So, I mean, and one place to look is Switzerland, right? So Switzerland is like a unique kind of test bubble for direct democracy in the whole world. They have a very unique electoral system. You should read up about it, very collaborative. And they have referendums all the time. It's one after another after another. And they can be initiated by the government. They can be initiated by citizens. There's various means. Um, their voter turnout, I don't know, it's something like 30%. People don't come out to vote because they can vote on all these other things. 
and they pick what other things they want to vote on. So if there's five referendums in a year, some of them only 30% of people might turn out to vote. Another one, maybe 20% will come. If it's a high, uh, hot issue, maybe you know 60 or 70% will come to vote in that referendum. And in that way, citizens are constantly shaping policy and they become more important than the elected representatives to some degree. But again, the participation is not high because people are overwhelmed. And when you look at, not, I'm not saying they're unhappy, I'm, I'm sure they're very happy with their system in Switzerland, but I'm just saying more opportunities to engage, like Byron said, when everybody already feels like, whoa, there's so, many, so much to learn just in a party platform. I'm not really sure we're quite, uh, we're quite ready for that. And, you know, and specifically, if you look at direct democracy in theory, it sounds very good. Let's all sit around the kitchen table and we'll all explain our positions and then we'll vote. But in reality, you get things like the Ontario referendum in 2007, where 100% uh, of the media was opposed to PR. The media decided they wouldn't cover the Citizens' Assembly. They would only write op-eds against PR. The government wasn't going to help because they didn't support the change. And people had no idea what they were voting on and that effectively killed PR in Ontario for more than 10 years now. So when it's not done right, I don't think it's helpful. Um, so I guess that would be my comment. Let's see. Uh, one principle that wasn't mentioned was avoiding strategic voting. A PR system should encourage all voters to vote their true preference. Any thought on how the various versions of MMP would fare on that standard? Byron. Um, oh dear, I, um, I read up on that a little bit, but, uh, uh, but not enough to do a decent job of answering the question. I do know that historically there have been uh, variations of MMP that did suffer from some forms of strategic voting. Uh, so, for example, uh, parties sort of uh, twinning themselves, and uh, and somehow that worked to to the advantage. But I confess I don't remember details of that. My impression is that modern designs of of MMP have fared okay with that, and that strategic voting isn't a big deal. But I don't, I'm not real confident on that. Anita, do you have more details? Yeah, I do, but I'm going to struggle a little bit to explain it. Um, so I think the first thing is to define what you mean by strategic voting. So if what you mean by strategic voting is I can't vote for what I want, I have to plug my nose and vote for the candidate I can't stand, <laughs> to stop another party from winning a 40% majority government. Uh, all PR systems for Canada basically de almost eliminate that. Because whether you have MMP, STV, or RUPR, um, or, sorry, rural urban PR, no alphabet soup today, um, then you're not going to have 40% majority governments if the system's designed properly and you can vote for what you want and you're not going to have any bad effects as a result of voting for what you want. You're not going to be told, oh, because you voted green, you helped elect Stephen Harper. That, that kind of stuff is gone. When you talk about other kinds of strategic voting, it exists in all systems. So if you look at strategic voting just as voters voting for something other than their first choice to try to get a specific outcome, that happens in all the systems, including proportional systems. It happens to a great extent in Sweden. There's been a, and they have a 4% threshold in an in open list system. And there's crazy strategic voting there. But it's people voting to try to get the government they want. So they decide, uh, oh, you know, we'd, I'd like this person to be Minister of the Environment, and I would like this par par party for sure to be in the coalition. Even though they're not my first choice, I want them in the coalition. Or I want them to have more say in the coalition. And so they'll vote for a party that's not their first choice to try to get a certain outcome. That happens in all PR systems. Um, if you look at MMP in particular, it's susceptible to a certain kind of strategic voting, where if you think about the fact that probably two-thirds of the seats are first past the post. Uh, whenever you have two-thirds of the seats that are first past the post, there's going to be decisions voters make when they're faced with a first past the post ballot. That's, you know, um, so I mean voters often split their ticket, okay? 
So in a local riding, somebody might not vote green in the local riding. They know the green has no chance, but they might vote green on the regional list, for example. Um, and parties may direct, and they do, uh, direct their supporters to say, uh, give this party my, the list vote, you know, to try to create a certain outcome. You know, vote this way locally, but on the list, give this other party your vote, not our party, because we don't need list seats. We're not going to get any list seats anyway. We want all the local ridings, but we want to work with this other party. So don't vote for us on the list, vote for the other party. So there's a lot of that kind of engineering, but it's not the same kind of strategic voting campaigns that you would see in Canada that really um, turns people off. I think in terms of whether MMP or STV leads to more strategic voting, um, STV, I think, is the better system for almost eliminating strategic voting. Because when you have a system where you can rank as many candidates on a ballot as you want in any order that you want and every other single voter in that riding can do the same thing, it's impossible to coordinate people and it's impossible to try to predict what the outcome will be. So there's not much strategic voting that can go on with STV. Byron, did, did, any, did anything, if I said anything that doesn't sound quite right, let me know. <laughs> I think it's fine. Okay. Um, do multiple member proportional systems decrease whipping the vote? I don't think so. No. They're, they're very party centric, and the parties, you know, the party is uh, is party centric systems or systems that whip votes, and MMP is still party centric. I would say, um, since I've had international guests on webinars before, I always have asked them this privately, <laughs> and I've asked academics as well, um, and there's really no correlation that we can find between electoral systems and party discipline. So it's bad news if you think that PR is going to make your MP freer to uh, vote against the party in many of the proportional systems, including uh, Ireland single transferable vote they have uh, the most candidate centered system in the entire world and yet the parties are whipped more than here um, and it's the same in other countries that use PR it's not related to the voting system it's related to the political and, and party culture unfortunately mm -hmm. the one thing that I can say uh, in favor of single transferable vote on this issue. One of the reasons the BC Citizens Assembly chose STV was because they felt it would decrease the power of the political parties over the over the MLAs. That was a specific identified thing they heard from British Columbians. We would like to see more freedom for our MLAs and that they're more responsive to the local voters rather than to the party. So they had an idea that, that, might, that STV might make that happen. I haven't seen that in practice around the world, to be honest, but um, the way it could happen is that STV is more likely to elect independents. So if an MP uh, who is, belongs to a party and is fed up with the party whip and uh, quits the party, which we've seen happen in Canada, and runs as an independent, they would be more likely to win uh, under an STV system than under an MMP system if the voters wanted them to win, mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes sense. So there's career options for politicians that aren't attached to a party machine, possibly. Um, okay. Do you have any idea how much the riding size in BC would increase if we go to province-wide MMP? So those are some of the design decisions that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, and in particular, it depends on what's the ratio of the local MPs to the regional MPs. Um, and you know, if on the low end, if you have a third of the MPs be regional MPs, then ridings would be half again as big. Uh, take your own riding and half of the next door neighbor riding, and that's about how big it would be. Uh, if you had 50-50, a uh, 50-50 uh, split between the local MPs and the 
and the regional MPs, then on average your audience would be twice as big. Right. And to now, go back that, to yeah, but that's assuming that you don't increase the size of the legislature, that you still have, what is it, 87 uh, MMPs, MLAs in, uh, in BC. Right. And I mean, it's easy to sit and say, well, I don't want my riding twice as big, so maybe we'll have like just 30% of uh, the regional MPs. But there's a big trade-off with that. Um, there's a big trade-off. If you have a small region size, and not enough list MPs, you're increasing the disproportionality of your results. Where parties that get a significant share of the vote in your region can't get a list seat because there aren't enough list seats. There's only two or three list seats in your small region and only 30% overall and the big parties get them and the smaller parties can be shut out. So I think most PR advocates, that's why we would like to see a regions that on average are bigger but perhaps in certain regions, um, such as British Columbia's north, for example, there are eight MLAs there. I cannot imagine a model that would not just keep the north as one region. Even though it's less proportional for those voters, they would still be getting a fairly good amount of proportionality mm -hmm. in keeping all the MLAs within their region. So it's not going to be like, oh, we're in BC, we're going to have an MMP system with 15 member regions. So there's 15 members every, in every region. No, it's not like that. Every region would have a different amount of MLAs elected depending on uh, the design considerations. And there are special areas that are going to be smaller. Um, and that's what an independent boundaries commission is for. So when the independent, when the BC Citizens Assembly said STV, for example, they said two to seven members. And then the Boundaries Commission went out and talked to people in communities and they found out which communities should only be two members and which should be up to seven members. And it would be the same with mixed member proportional where it would be determined independently uh, how big those regions would be in different areas. One would hope anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. With the threat, oh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. I was just going to say the next question is: Would the threshold be uh, set regionally or provincially in BC's case, or federally in Canada's case? And um, I can't imagine a scenario in which you'd want to have different thresholds in different areas. I think that would be set. Re uh, sorry, for the entire province, or for BC, or for the entire uh, country federally. Um, there's just not enough reason to vary that from place to place. And I, I think also you need to look at whether you really want to set a threshold. It seems it's a good way to be able to say to opponents, oh look, fringe parties can't win seats because we've set the threshold at 5%. And I mean, if that needs to be done, that's fine. But naturally, the threshold in these regions to get a seat is already going to be probably higher than 5%. And in some regions, it'll be a lot higher just because of the number of list seats available. So there's not really a need to set a threshold. You risk a situation. You risk a situation where a party does very well in one region and should get a list seat, but because the province has said if you don't get five percent across this entire province, you don't get that list seat. So, in a in a way, it's sort of keeping smaller parties that have a concentrated regional base out. And you can see the pluses and minuses of that, if that makes sense. I would imagine we will see a threshold. Um, is there a, some form of best runners up, a good way to determine the regional seats? Wouldn't best runners up ease the opposition argument? What are the best runners up downsides? So I think the best runner-up is, is just another name for what I described as the third option, the, the list-free option, where you take the, you know, you determine how many seats each party should have and you fill that out from the candidates who got the most votes but didn't get the seat. In other words, we're the best runner-up. Um, I think the, the advantage of that is that it really, uh, uh, keeps things simple for the voter. Uh, you know, it's from the voter's perspective, it's the same uh, as we have now. 
uh, in terms of the ballot and all. Um, and so, so that's good. On the downside, though, it strikes me as, as one of those ideas where, yeah, it's simple, but perhaps too simple in that it doesn't allow voters to give their full, um, you know, to, to express their full preferences. And, um, and I'm just not convinced that I'd, I'd have to look at it in more detail, but it just has something niggling at me that, that what it does is it rewards candidates who are in really tight races. Um, and it would reward candidates that are in somewhat larger ridings. You know, so I, I'd want to look at some of those effects. It, it's certainly not a slam dunk for me. But I'm, a, I'm afraid I can't be more specific than that right now. I think, I mean, the appeal of it is obviously for people that are nervous about any kind of list. Even an open list where us voters are the ones determining the most popular candidates that get elected regionally. The word list um, sometimes freaks people out and it's the same reason why some people prefer single transferable vote. It's list, list free, right? So the best runners up, it's simple, there's no list. Most people understand the concept of the best runners up get the seats. Um, on the downside, it, it does provide a lot less choice for voters over local and regional, you just get less say. If I'm sitting on my ballot, I'm looking at my ballot in my local writing, um, try to think of the choices you'd make knowing that you either have to kind of vote thinking to tr I'm trying to help my local MP here get elected or vote trying to think, okay, the guy, I'm not really sure, but it might help, uh, my guy might be the best runners up in the regional contest. If I vote this smaller party, maybe he'll be the best runners up, but maybe he won't be. It's, I don't know, I'm not doing a good job of explaining it, but I think what Byron is saying is it's a little over simple um, and therefore it's not possibly not quite as fair when it's used in as the foundation for the whole system. The other, th the main criticism we hear all the time against best runners up for the regional seats is that it doesn't provide those uh, mechanisms for electing more women and minorities. So if, a, if seeing a more diverse BC legislature um, with more, you know, more women, more indigenous, more minorities, more people that look like BC in the legislature is a priority for you, even if it's not a first priority, uh, you don't want best runners up. Because what best runners up does is it's entirely first past the post, single member winner races. So it doesn't provide those incentives um, to be able to choose from several candidates. It doesn't provide the parties with incentives to run a diverse list or a diverse set of candidates because there are no lists and there are no more choices other than the one guy from one party that you get to choose just like now. So we won't see an increase in diversity with best runners up. Do you see another one, Byron? I'm just catching up here. Well, um, one person asked oh. how has progress for first for fair vote been this year? That would definitely be your question. Sort of a uh, sort of a, a general question. Maybe be pretty quick about that one. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? Maybe I can. You can email me, and I'll tell you. I mean, really, there was a lot of angry, discouraged, disappointed, um, and disgusted people after Justin Trudeau came out on February first and said you know what, I'm dropping this because I didn't get the system that I wanted. So now I'm going to make a whole bunch of stuff up. And if you voted for me because of this, well, too bad. You know, there's not enough of you, so I don't have to care. I'm paraphrasing his position, but that's basically it. So there's a lot of people that are unhappy and are looking ahead to the 2019 election about how we can make this an issue again. Um, and our main focus right at this moment is the BC referendum. This is a very uphill battle for us. Huge moneyed interests um, lining up against us. And so we need all the help we can get. We cannot afford to lose this referendum. And a win in BC about a year from now would be a huge boost uh, to putting this back on the agenda federally. So I guess that would be where I'm at with that. Um, how, sh let's see. Okay, I'm gonna take like two more questions and that's it because it's 3.30. Um, somebody wants to know, 
oh, could Byron talk about the current situation in Germany? It keeps being described as a crisis in the Canadian media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's happening in Germany? Um, they've they've had an election uh, and are trying to form a government, um, and the various parties are being fractious enough that they're having difficulty forming a coalition. Um, so, and and the media pundits, at least on this side of the water, are saying, and if they had an election, it would just be the same as it is now. So nothing gained. So what I've read is that uh, that Andrew Merkel's major coalition part, party in or partner in the past has said, no, I don't want to do it anymore uh, for their own reasons, and I'm not sure what those reasons are. So. One option is to try and form a coalition with other members, with, with other parties, which is proving difficult. Um, another option is to for Merkel's party, who, who got the largest share of the vote, to go forward with a minority government and try to um, piece together a support on a bill-by-bill -bill basis. And Andrea Merkel has predictably said, no, she doesn't want to do that. Uh, that's too tenuous. But, um, you know, I think that good government requires us to reach compromises. And so I think for myself, rather than have another election, I'd encourage them to try, if they can't come to a long-term agreement uh, and form a coalition, that I'd, I'd encourage them to attempt to rule as a minority government to try and on an issue by issue basis form a consensus and see where they get. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say about that. I mean, it's, it's, if the country is divided, then, well, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem wise to me to, to enforce agreement where none exists. I think I can comment on that a little bit. Um, the media loves this stuff, so mm -hmm. you know, whenever there's a government isn't formed like pretty much instantly, it's it's a crisis, okay? And it's a drama. And tune in for soap opera world or whatever. If the first set of negotiations uh, doesn't succeed, then wow, the country's falling apart. They're going to lose their status in the European Union, and you know, stability will never return, and all this kind of drama okay every other every other coalition in Germany has formed like no problem so they're having the first little bump in the road that they've they've ever had and it's to give you I mean they did the media did the same thing in New Zealand where you know it took about three weeks to form a government this time because three different parties were negotiating and every day it was like oh look at this is terrible they did the same thing in Ireland it took two months last time to form a government in Ireland which was very unusual because their average time is 21 days to form a government coalition government in Ireland and this time it took 60 days because the voters had some very nuanced things to say such as we're a little bit tired of the main parties and we'd like to elect 22 independents and now you guys figure it out <laughs> so, I'm giving you the summary so what happened is there was there were extensive and complicated negotiations, and guess what? They uh, formed a minority coalition with independence in the cabinet and a confidence and supply agreement with the other party, and they have a stable government that's doing some really cool things. If anybody wants to know, just ask me. So sometimes these things take a little longer to work themselves out, but it's not a failure of the system. It's just a part of the system. Our other option is we can have a 39% single party majority government that can get started the day after the election. And then they can spend four years doing things that people don't like, and then we can all vote again and watch half of those things get undone. That's the other option. So I don't think it's a crisis in Germany. And actually, one thing I did look at was the research on how long does it take to form a government with PR countries. On average, it's 29 days. So it's not one day, like first past the post. It's 29 days on average. But there's countries like Denmark where their average is four days. And then there's countries like Belgium who are extreme outliers who typically take months to form a government. That's their political culture. Okay, I think I can wait a few weeks for a good government. Um, I'm going to do one more and then we're done because everybody's been wonderful, patient, and there's all kinds of questions. 
Um, so somebody wants to know, okay, I'm, this is a good place to end actually. Um, so somebody's saying with rural urban PR, the size, the increased size of the riding would be reduced. And so that is uh, a good time to say that our next webinar with Byron is on, in December, I think it's December 12th, is on rural urban proportional. And yep. that is 100% correct that one of the main goals of rural urban proportional is to take MMP and STV, put them together, adapt them for our geography, and make sure those already large rural ridings don't get much bigger. Byron, do you have anything to add before we... The only thing I want to add is thank you all for tuning in today and uh, asking some very good questions, and uh, hope you come back again at the next webinar. Um, Thanks again. Uh, you know what? It's been really amazing seeing the level of questions. It shows that people are really interested and they're really getting it. Um, so yeah, I would just want to encourage you to get, if you're in British Columbia, to get involved with the BC campaign. Um, if you are not in British Columbia uh, and you can contribute to help our grassroots teams do their work, um, please consider donating to us today. We are up against a you know, a party that raised $12 million in BC last year and is, has said that they are hell-bent on defeating this referendum. So please, uh, if you can, chip in whatever way you can to help the grassroots win this one. Okay, thanks a lot everyone.